If you have been a comic reader long enough, you may have stumbled upon this symbol on the cover of more than a few of your comics. This is the seal of the Comics Code Authority. But what does it mean, and why is it there, and where did it come from? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions, I'm Scott, I'm sick again, and remember last year when I said that the Comics Code Authority was an episode entirely on its own? The Comics Code Authority is an episode entirely on its own. I think I'm finally going to get around to it today. The Comics Code Authority, or CCA, is a massive part of comics history that we as fans cannot ignore. That being said, this subject is incredibly dense, and I had to make a lot of cuts in the script because there is no way that I could cover everything. I encourage you guys to do your own follow-up research if you want to look into it a little bit further. I suggest the documentary Diagram for Delinquents as a good starting point. But with that said, let's learn about the history of the Comics Code Authority. First and foremost, what is it? Well, to put it simply, the CCA was a way for publishers to self-regulate the type of stories, images, language, and other aspects of their comics. You can kind of consider them like the MPAA for comic books, censoring anything that they find not suitable for children. Shut up, past Scott. This isn't your time. Anyway, if there's one thing most people know about the code, it's that it was strict. The first set of rules included such restrictions as, in every instance, good shall triumph over evil, and the criminal punished for his misdeeds. All characters shall be depicted in a dress reasonably acceptable to society. Profanity, obscenity, smut, vulgarity, or words or symbols which have acquired undesirable meanings are forbidden. These are just some and not even the most interesting ones, personally. If you want to look at the whole list, I will leave a link in the description below for you to check it out. But the original rules that I want to focus on are in regards to the comic titles and covers. Specifically, no comics magazine shall use the word horror or terror in its title, restraint in the use of the word crime in titles or subtitles shall be exercised, and the word crime shall never appear alone on a cover. To me, these are the big rules, at least the rules that really help you understand the state of comics before the code was put in place in the mid-1950s. As I've mentioned a few times before, superhero comics were really popular in the early 40s, but started dying out near the end of the decade and the beginning of the 50s. They were still around, but the comic industry started exploring other genres of storytelling. Two of the most popular were crime and horror. There really wasn't censorship or approval, any sort of approval system for comics at the time, so writers and artists could show these gruesome and intensely violent scenes and stories and young kids would read them like crazy. A huge issue facing American culture at the time was juvenile delinquency. Parents were worried that their children were starting to have too much freedom and didn't respect authority, and they saw these crime comic books as part of the problem. The crime books were notorious for showing criminal activity in a desirable fashion. There were even cases of the comics showing the specifications for how to commit crimes, which some worried would inspire the young readers to try it for themselves. Writer Sterling North called them, among many other things, a quote, violent stimulant, and said that parents and teachers throughout America must band together to break the comic magazine. There were also educators who believed that comics were making children illiterate because they were reading them instead of true literature. Then, of course, there were religious groups who had strong objections to the highly immoral content in crime and horror comics, but the real focus was on the mental effects that comics had on the minds of young children. Enter Dr. Frederick Wortham. You can't really talk about the Comics Code Authority without at least mentioning Wortham. He was a psychiatrist who was notorious for his crusade against comics. In 1946, Wortham had set up a very low-cost psychiatric clinic in Harlem for the underprivileged. Working in this clinic, he saw many children suffering from anything from mental health issues, reading disabilities, and even kids who had issues with authority and or committed misdemeanors. And he noticed that the common thread was that they all had read comics. In all reality, though, this isn't super surprising, right? At this time, it was reported that somewhere between, uh, somewhere around 90% of both young boys and girls were reading some type of comic book. Some have accused Wortham of a sort of confirmation bias. Of course he thinks comics are harmful to kids because the only kids he sees in his clinic are the ones who need his psychiatric help. He isn't exposed as often to kids who read comics and are perfectly fine. Maybe his argument is based on a deductive fallacy. These kids are violent and have mental issues. These kids read comics. Therefore, comics cause kids to be violent and have mental issues. Regardless, Wortham called together a conference on the psychopathology of comic books in early 1948. This symposium would inspire a few articles in Time Magazine, the Saturday Review of Literature, and the Reader's Digest to be written up and bring the issue of comic books 
no pun intended, to the public eye and build momentum for the case against comics. It wasn't long after that that cities across America started censoring and banning comics. In some cases, selling crime comics to anyone under 18 was a misdemeanor punishable by hefty fines or even jail time. There were even a few towns that had public comic book burnings where hundreds or even thousands of issues were burned in protest. As you can imagine, the comic book industry was hit pretty hard because of all of this, so they tried to fix it and get on everyone's good side again. A few publishers came together and formed the Association of Comics Magazine Publishers, or ACMP, in July of 1948. This was their way of assuring parents that their concerns were being heard and the comic publishers were trying to address them. The ACMP was marketed as having, quote, a code of ethics to assure good taste and high editorial standards. Only comic magazines that meet the code requirements are permitted to use the special code seal. There were a few problems with this though. Number one, not many publishers decided to get on board with the seal. And number two, the seal didn't really do anything. The code was basically defunct a short two years later, but comics were still being printed with that seal. Director Henry Schultz said in 1950 that the association and code were both out of business. In fact, Schultz went on record in the 1954 Senate subcommittee into juvenile delinquency hearings by saying, quote, we do no self-regulation at all, except as it may exist in the mind of the editors as they proceed in their daily work. It may have initially been an organization where publishers would have to submit comics to be approved, but that was completely gone only a few years later. Those publishers were able to put that seal on their comics without having anyone actually review them. I mentioned congressional hearings in 1954. These are super important. Originally, they were just hearings established to investigate the issue of juvenile delinquency, but the real focus became centered around crime and horror comics and the effect that they had on children. Around the same time, Frederick Wortham released his most famous publication, Seduction of the Innocent. This book was essentially a warning of the negative nature of comic books and how they can easily corrupt the minds of young people. The book was a huge success that led to Wortham being a main player at the Senate at subcommittee hearings where he just tore down the comic book industry by saying things like, quote, I think Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry. Ouch. So obviously the comic book industry walked out of the hearings pretty hurt, and the publishers and distributors decided to try again to make a comics code, and this time stick to it. So they formed the Comics Magazine Association of America later that year in 1954 and created the Comics Code Authority. The way it worked is that they would hire someone outside any individual publisher to review the comics before they would be published and make sure that they adhere to the standards of the code. If a comic met the code requirements, it would go out with a seal of approval on it, but if it did not meet the requirements, it would have to be edited first to meet the standards, or it would have to be scrapped altogether. A lot of publishers went out of business because their toned down stories just weren't selling as well as their crime and horror comics. The original code was just way too strict. Thankfully, things started to loosen up a little in the 70s with a rewrite of the code. One of these rewrites was born thanks to The Amazing Spider-Man number 96 that dealt with the issue of drug use. That comic was specifically requested to be made by the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, but Marvel still couldn't get the code to sign off on the story because it violated a vague clause in the comics code. So they just printed the comic without the code's approval, and it was a success. After that, the code started going through more changes and rewrites through the late 80s as well. By that point, the rules weren't very strict, but just a little bit more generalized. It was more like, just do your best, use your best judgment, don't do anything distasteful, okay? Eventually the code just kind of disappeared, faded out of existence. Independent publishers didn't use the code and retailers didn't really care anymore. They sold them anyway. Plus, many publishers started using their own in-house rating systems for comics. In 2011, the last two publishers to still use the code were Archie and DC. Archie admitted to not actually sending their comics in for approval, but just printing the seal on their covers anyway, since their comics were pretty kid-friendly. DC, on the other hand, was still sending their comics Comics in for approval. However, the company in charge of overseeing the Comics Magazine Association of America was the Kellen Company, who said that they stopped reviewing comics two years prior in 2009. So who is reviewing all of those DC comics? Well, it was one single woman named Holly Munter Koenig who was reading and approving all of these DC comics by herself in her house out of the passion she had for what the CMAA stood for. But in 2011, both DC and Archie officially dropped the code seal from their comics and the CCA 
was gone for good. Now I do want to talk a little bit about Frederick Wortham because I feel like he's the guy that everyone points to when they think of how awful and strict the CCA was and how it kind of ruined the comic book industry at the time and created this stigma that is still present today about comics solely being for children. The fact of the matter is Wortham did not want the Comics Code Authority or any kind of self-regulation. He didn't want it. He didn't like it. Heck, they even offered him the job as the director of the CCA and he turned it down. He continued to write articles against it after it came out. He was as against the code as you might have been. The key thing that Wortham wanted to do was simply restrict the selling of comics to children, specifically crime and horror comics, though he was also not a huge fan of superheroes either. He felt like Superman taught kids that they can save the day by being stronger than your enemy and beating them up. Wortham was anti-violence. He believed that human violence could be completely eliminated someday, but he felt like these comics were teaching kids that violence isn't bad at all, but entertaining and amusing. And that's why he set out to do what he did, not so that a comic code could be put in place, not so that comics would be heavily censored or made illegal, but just so that certain comics couldn't be sold to children under a certain age. So maybe Wortham's intentions were good, but you know what they say about history being written by the victors. So here's a huge question for you guys, one that could be, and I might even turn into its own episode someday, should comics have stricter censorship? Now I know that a lot of you guys are going to instinctively say no, but hear me out on this one. I've always held the belief that limitations lend themselves to creativity. I was on the Weekly Poll podcast not too long ago, link in the description if you wanna go check it out, and Sal from TV Little House mentioned that he thinks DC's animated stuff has lost its subtlety because now they can just show whatever they want, whereas before, the writers had to think of creative ways to get around the censors. Perhaps the movies and shows actually benefited from that censorship. Plus think of all the fun and goofy Silver Age comics that we had, probably thanks to the CCA. Read literally any of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. I don't even read them, just Google some of the issue covers. They're amazing. Again, this could totally be its own entire episode, but I want to know what you guys think. Are you for 100% creative freedom for the writers and artists, or do you think a stricter set of rules might actually enhance comics? Let me know in the comments. Once again, I want to stress that this topic is exhaustive and there's no way that I could have fit everything into this one video without it taking up an hour at least. There's a lot of good stuff that I lazily brushed over. So if you are interested in this topic, go do some research of your own and see what you find. And if this is your first time hanging out with us here at NerdSync, please hit that big sexy subscribe button. We do weekly comic book videos just like this one every Wednesday. We don't want you to miss out on any of it. Once again, I'm Scott. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and we'll see you on Friday for a tie-in video and more things that you thought you knew about comics. See ya.